Welcome everyone to Harmony House webinar on this beautiful evening. House webinar on this beautiful evening. House webinar on this beautiful evening. House. Little feedback there, uh, Pavitra. Let me start again. Welcome everyone to Harmony House webinar on this beautiful evening. My name's Peter, and it's my pleasure to be with you for the next short while. And welcome, Ken, Ken O'Donnell. Ken O'Donnell, it's a, a joy and a true privilege to be in your presence and to discover we are indeed much better than we think we are. I'm sure you can remember Kuwait in March 2016 when you visited us and gave us two excellent seminars at the Alhambra Tower and uh, JW Marriott Hotel. For those who don't know Ken, um, Ken carries with him a wisdom of experience. He's a global consultant, trainer, author, and much respected and sought after as a speaker at congresses and symposiums around the world on themes of advanced quality management, ethics in the workplace, human factors, self-management, and quality of life programs, to name but a few. His sharing this evening, uh, we are much better than we think we are, is so timely for the times we are currently in now, these rap times of rapid change. So Ken, we are honored to welcome you and look forward very much to your sharing. It has been translated into eight languages this evening, into Portuguese and Spanish and Dutch and French and Tamil and Hindi and Turkish and Arabic. So many, many thanks to in advance to all the translators who are working very, very dedicatedly this evening to bring the message to you from Ken. And to our beautiful guests this evening, if you have any questions, Please, in the, please put them in the usual way into the chat box and we'll address as many as we can. So Ken, once again, a very warm welcome and over to you. And we look forward to your sharing with us this evening. Ken. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> Thanks so much. How long uh, do you want for the question so that I can, I can organize myself accordingly? We, the questions aren't here yet. So as you speak, so the questions no, will come no, but from want to leave for it. So please proceed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so thanks so much. I, I This morning I was with a whole lot of people from Latin America and they greeted me with flowers. Uh, online, of course, you can't. That they were sort of such a nice gesture. So I thought the same. I'm going to greet you with flowers. It's a, sort of a meditation <laughs> here. So please accept. But it also, it's not just a flower to accept. There's something I want to talk about. You see, everything that's in this flower came out of a very tiny seed, very tiny seed. So all of this manifestation of the blooms of the petals and everything else, you would not imagine it to be within a tiny seed. I think this is a chrysanthemum, if I'm not wrong. And I don't know if you've ever seen chrysanthemum seeds. They are extremely, extremely tiny. And so this was in a little tiny seed. And it just... So na nature has this wonderful a way to organize things, self-organize things, actually. And in a way, um, we are very beautiful beings when we're in that sort of a seed state. But if you throw a seed in the desert, or if you, throw, if you don't treat the seed well, if you don't give it enough light, enough water, you don't give it a good, good soil, uh, the seed may, may not grow or will grow strangely. And in a way, it's a little bit like this. Because at a deep level, at a deep level, I truly believe that we are good. 
if you've ever seen a cross section of the earth, you know, and you see the surface, and then you see all different levels until you get to the, the core of the earth, which is sort of a molten ball. And of course, we don't know any, we're not aware of anything like that under, underneath the surface of the earth. All of our concerns, in fact, are on the surface and the division of territories and the division of the map and the division of the seas and all sorts of things. And we isolate ourselves into sort of countries in which, you know, they're, they're not intrinsically um, part of the system. The, we've artificially created all of these different countries, you could say, because we're the only ones in nature that recognize them. You know, the birds and the animals and the insects, they don't recognize our borders. You know, if you have a, a bird on the border of Afghanistan and, and uh, Iran, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, you couldn't ask the bird which country you do, be, do you belong to. I mean, I once asked this question, I was going around Latin America and um, on, a, on a sort of a lecture tour. And I asked this question of different audiences here and there, what's your national bird? And in Colombia, they said the condor. The condor is like a big eagle that flies in the high mountains. Now I asked the same question in Bolivia, what's your national bird, the condor? In Argentina, what's your national bird, the condor? In Peru, what's your national bird, the condor? <clears throat> and I thought, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> um, I thought, well, first of all, if I were a condor, I'd have a nationality crisis. Uh, I wouldn't know. Of course, first of all, the condor doesn't even know that it's a condor, right? It's a word that we've given to it. Especially, we didn't ask permission if we could use uh, use the, the bird as a national emblem. So human beings have separated the, the world out. I remember once I met Edgar Mitchell. He, he was one of the one of the few uh, human beings who walked on the moon. He was an astronaut, and he was close in touch with us in Miami. You know, I think I met him in London and he was giving a talk. He was describing his experience coming back from the moon. He said he was looking at out, the, out the, the porthole, I don't know what you call the window of the spaceship, and he could see the earth. And of course, the earth from where he was was just a tiny ball, you know. And he put his glove against the, the windscreen and just with his thumb, he could... His thumb was bigger than the, than the earth was. And as he arrived closer and closer, he saw four colors, only four colors. He saw browns, red, uh, browns, greens, blues, and whites. And that was it. And so he, he became so touched from this experience of seeing, of course, we imagine the world with these different lines that we call countries that are not intrinsically part of the earth. And we create borders and fights and so on because of these, these lines that we arbitrarily draw on maps sometimes. It's just like a division. I remember at the border of North Korea and South Korea, it's just incredible, you know, the tension that's there. And it's just an arbitrary line that the UN drew after as a sort of a, a settlement. And, um, and he came back to, to, to earth and he was so touched, he was so spiritually touched by that experience that he uh, created what's called, together with another great person called Willis Harmon, he called, he created the no Noetic Science Institute. It's sort of an institute that tries to bring together consciousness and science. And of course, that's still there till today. Of course, Edgar is not around anymore, but it was such a moving experience. He was so touched that his friends and relatives thought he you know, became a little bit mentally 
affected by the experience, but it was a genuine experience of we are one, you know. So even if everything may be important and strange on the surface of the earth between one place and the other, if you go down deep into the earth, it's just the same core for the whole earth, right? It's the same core. And you probably find the basic uh, elements like iron and aluminium and, and so on. All of these different silicon, especially. And so we divide this planet and we forget, in fact, our essential humanity. So I wanted to get back to this, you know, the, what is the seed that could, if it had the right conditions, what is the seed of me that could, if it had the right conditions, blossom into something very beautiful and, and useful? And all of us have that potential. Just me, we need to understand that there is that essence of goodness in us that needs to be, first of all, discovered and then um, cultured, cultivated, so that it comes out. And this is our challenge. I'm going to show you some, some slides now. So let me go to the, this one. And uh, this is the title of our talk here. Um, where are you? you know, we're in a world which is pretty dangerous at the moment. Uh, we're still having big problems with COVID in, in Brazil, where I am at the moment. It's, I think it's had almost 600,000 deaths. It's just second behind the USA. And, of course, everyone knows someone who's, who's, who's died, basically, because of the COVID. So the, the tension is really great still. And now that this new variant is here, everyone is scared, right? more scared than they were before. So it's pretty crazy, this, this situation. But it's not just the virus that's floating around in the air that we have to protect ourselves from somehow. We have to discover ourselves in this crazy environment, which is another, you know, I have to discover the seed of the flower that I could be in terms of virtues. I have to discover that seed in this crazy environment. So it's not an easy thing with all sorts of things going, worries and stress and obstacles and the consciousness of being a victim, complaints and more complaints, anxieties, just seeing and cultivating a negative worldview. I think we all know that we do that all the time. And therefore we, we remain in this ambient, this environment, which is not conducive to bringing out the best in us. In fact, on the contrary, we allow this environment and all of these things going on around us to bury the seed of our potential even more. So to be under that canopy of protection, right? I need to have four things basically. I need to cultivate self-respect. I, I think that of all of the hundreds of people, maybe thousands that I've talked to on a personal level in my life about the different situations and obstacles they are facing, I don't think I've met one person that has not said that the seed of their problems is their own lack of self-respect. That's where this title, we are greater than we think we are, comes from. There are th there's an inner value that I need to bring out. I need to discover and bring it out. So part of that is to work on understanding. I have to understand more things. I have to understand, you know, who I am. I have to understand the world in so some of the rules of the laws of life uh, so that I can play better in the game. When I was younger, I played rugby in Australia. I'm Australian by birth. And the only sport they had at school during the winter was rugby. So I played it, you know. Uh, football, soccer wasn't, wasn't on, the, on the cards. In other states, maybe, but not where I was. So 
Um, now, a rugby, in a rugby game, if you ever see one, the objective is to stop the person who's carrying a ball. If he carries a ball across a line, he wins some points. So the objective of one team is to stop the player from crossing the line. And it's quite violent, you know. They really, uh, they get the person up, hind him and try to get rake the ball out of his hands. And it's quite violent, you know. Um, and if you tried to play soccer, which has another set of rules, it's only played with your feet. If you tried to play soccer with the rules of rugby, you'd be sent off in the first minute you'd get a red card. So in the game of life, we have to understand the rules of the game in a way. So we can put that on our list. I need to understand better all of these things that I've mentioned here. The, the, the third thing I need is to develop my resilience, like my power to, to withstand my ability to respond, all that's connect with resilience. And finally, especially important these days, is to strengthen my emotional immunity. That means what's going around, and uh, here we've got all of these physics, uh, these, some physical things and also uh, physical conditions, but also uh, it's the atmosphere of the world that can affect us. And it's the atmosphere of the people who we live with, who can be, you know, quite heavy and they could be affecting us also. So I need to strengthen my emotional immunity. So having said that, you know, we start off our lives pretty okay, right? This young boy, he's not thinking about much at all. He's just sort of enjoying climbing up the stairs, right? Maybe not even six months old, maybe six months, a little bit more. And he's just enjoying being on the stairs. He has no further thought, probably, except maybe ah, I'll get to the top, but he has no idea of the top, actually. At that age, there's no separation between where my hands finish and where the stairs begin, you know, where uh, mother's hand is and where my hand starts. So there's no ego separation at that age. Everything's just a wonderful world of adventure and, and discovery. But 30 years later, you know, that same little boy, where did he get all this stuff from in his head, you know? Where did it come from? And what has been buried by all of this stuff? You know, I was in Boston several years ago. And the people there had arranged a talk at the Harvard Law School. Um, we, had a, we had a meditation center similar to the ones that we have in Bahrain and in Kuwait, uh, across the road from Harvard University, on the main road there. We still got it, actually. And so... They wanted to organize a talk. And so what, what could we have for, for the people at Harvard, you know, the teachers and the students? And they, they came up with a title, uh, Think Less, Think Better. And this, in fact, is our objective. Nobody teaches us how to think, you know. When we were, you know, when we were young kids, it wasn't a concern. But as we grew up, no one taught us how to think. They, we learned how to walk, like this little kid. We learned, learned how to, to crawl. We learned how to use the body. We learned how to walk. We learned how to talk. We learned how to dance, maybe. We learned how to ride a bicycle. But no one, no one, no one, no one taught us how to think. And therefore, we accumulate. I think all of you probably agree that you think more than you need to. And as we think more and more and more, and a lot of that is just useless stuff, you know, it's just opinions and not even facts sometimes, just ideas and opinions, worries, all of those things that were outside the umbrella 
on the first page, the worries and the anxieties and the stress and the, and the complaints, we fill up our head with all of that stuff and we end up burying the seed of our goodness, of our inner beauty, you could say. And so, you know, there are, there's a game, I call it a game, but this is exactly how things happen, you know. I'm on one side and my higher objective is on the other side. Whatever I'd like to, to, to achieve. Just before this talk, I was with about 20 Brazilian um, executives, uh, you know, leaders, you could say, in a two-hour dialogue. And it was unanimous. They all said that they had really high objectives in their lives. But the difficulty was to make that objective real. I think all of you have been through that. All of us have great ideals. You know, we would like to, we'd like to be this, we'd like to be more happy, we'd like to be more peaceful, we'd like to be more loveful, we'd like to be so many things, more intelligent, maybe, more clear in my thinking. But sometimes things get in the way, right? Events happen. And if the event, if I don't make a big deal out of it, I can keep my objective and, and see the event at the same time without any problems. But sometimes if I make a mountain out of a molehill, you know, if I make that such a big deal that I get so much stuck in that event that I forget my objective. And this is ha what happens all the time. We make big deals out of obstacles Instead of just going around them or going over them or understanding them, we start to fight with the obstacles and then we get stuck and we forget our higher ideals. And after forgetting our higher ideals for a long amount of time, we start to think that we are not good enough, that we don't deserve to be. Maybe we don't say this to other people, but we start to think about it amongst ourselves. And we become, you know, we lose enthusiasm and so on. What I have to do is I have to, you know, keep that connection with my higher objective. And then I can, you know, make that whole thing become small again. You know, that, it, that it's just like this, you know, wait a minute. That's the ideal. I, I keep the event in mind, I do what I have to do, I say what I have to say, I interact uh, appropriately with that event, uh, whether it's with people, with nature, with anything, with work, but I don't lose sight of my higher objective. And this is probably the, the biggest challenge for all of us. I remember I think I'll stop it, stop the share a bit and talk to you directly. Yeah. I remember once uh, I met a woman. Uh, I live in the, near near Sao Paulo. In fact, uh, I'm in the mountains in a small town where we have a retreat place. But this woman came to me, and I, you know, she came for a course a meditation course, and then we were talking and she started to talk about her life and she said, you know, I grew up in a small town and my parents were really difficult people and because of that difficulty, I left home earlier than I should have and I tried to make it on my own, but it was really difficult. I ended up going to the capital city where I, you know, found an apartment, but it was really difficult to find the apartment. And then I started to do a course on, of dentistry. She wanted to be a dentist. And she said the course is really difficult. And then after finishing her degree, she set up a clinic with some people there in the town, uh, in her hometown, and then she said that the, my, my associates at the clinic, they were really difficult people. And, you know, in about 15 minutes, he used the word difficult. I don't know how many times. Difficult, 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 difficult. And, of course, that's our thinking. 
And I asked her, you know, in the story of your life, do you consider yourself to be a difficult person or not? And she said, yeah, I'm, really, I'm a really difficult person. And so I said, do you think that the fact that you are difficult has made all of these other things difficult? And she said, wow, I never have thought about that. <laughs> you know, it's like, it seems so obvious, right? But sometimes we get so much bogged down in our difficulties. We make such a big deal out of, you know, the, the problems that's, uh, that, that we were just talking about here. We make such a big deal out of the problems that we forget, you know, it becomes a huge ball in front of a huge obstacle. And in fact, obstacles exist exactly because I'm going somewhere. If I'm here in point A and I want to get to point B, the obstacle will appear on that line. It, it won't appear over here or over there, you know. It's because I'm going somewhere that I'm trying to go somewhere. I'm trying to get somewhere. I'm trying to arrive at a, a state or a decision or, a, or an experience that an obstacle will come exactly because I'm trying to go there. If I was going somewhere else, it wouldn't be an obstacle. So let me, let's understand that if I don't have obstacles, it's because I'm probably not going anywhere. And if I do have them, I should understand them. I should work, work it out. I'm going to give some examples here. There are two types of, of thinking. One is based on reality and the other is based on my imagination. Now, this is a pretty easy, a form, a pretty easy formula, right? Tension has two var variables, the pressure and the resistance. So let's look at that. There are two types of pressure, the real pressure. For example, I have to pay the rent. I have to, you know, put my kids through school. I have to, you know, I have to pay them, pay off the mortgage, whatever. I have to do so many things. And if I have some disability, like physical disability, I have, you know, a leg that doesn't work properly or an eye that doesn't work properly or a hand that doesn't work properly. It's a real pressure to live in a world with some disability. Or if I have children who have disabilities, these are real things, you know? So let me understand the real things, but there are also unreal pressures, things that I imagine and create in my own mind based on, you know, lack of information, apparently 95% of, of worry is useless because it doesn't have anything, anything to do with reality. I worry 95% of the time that I worry about something has nothing to do, it will never happen. And if I have more information, and then I, then I would have the right to worry, for example, I've got undeniable results of a medical examination that tells me that I have some fatal disease. Then I, you know, then with that sort of thing, yes, I have to deal with it. But I shouldn't just create out of nothing whole stories in my head that make me suffer or make me feel heavy. You know, fear and worry go together, especially in this world that we're living in today. You know, you never know what's going to happen. I remember one person was doing a retreat here and he told me this story. He said he was living in a part of the city where the lights were out in the night in one of the streets and he had to go down the hill to get to the, the bread shop to buy a loaf of bread. Okay, he comes down the hill um, and then goes back again. Now, on his way back, there was another person coming down the hill and he looked suspicious. And because everything was dark, he, he couldn't make it out. And so he thought, well, oh, this guy looks really suspicious. I think I'll, you know, I, I'll, I will avoid him. He, he may rob me and so on. Anyway, he had to go back to the bread shop. And as he walked in, he saw the guy there uh, having a cup of coffee at a table. He said, aren't you the same one that came down the hill just now? 
And he said, oh, yeah, I was there. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were a, a robber. And the other guy said, yeah, I thought you were a robber also. So both of them thinking that the other is something that they're not is because of lack of information. This is unreal pressure. And then, of course, if we want to reduce the, the pressure, we have to develop the, you know, if you remember your algebra, you reduce the nominator and you increase the denominator. And then you will decrease the, you know, the principal object, object here, which is tension. So what happens? To reduce the real pressures, you have to understand and accept them. To reduce the unreal ones, you have to control your thinking. And to develop your resilience, then that you can do that through meditation practice. And we're going to do, see that in a minute as we get there. Just to increase, have, a, have, you know, have an experience of, of, of meditation. And then if I, you know, if I decrease pressures and increase the resilience, I will reduce the tension. So we can all do that. Well, we can all do that, you know. But you see yourself. I mean, we looked at that picture of the umbrella before, but where do you, what do you tell yourself about your own self? What do you tell yourself? What's the inner narrative that's going on? You know? there, there could be a limited narrative in which you're becoming more and more reduced. You're reducing more and more your value because you're not, you know, you become absorbed in yourself and you're reducing your value. Therefore, you can't see how great you really are. You know, so you just fill up your head with your roles, with your life story, the worries about your health, your finances, relationships, and all of those things. And as you do that, you reduce yourself. Because you're done, you're just going around in circles with the same things, basically. You've got half a dozen main relationships, maybe. You've got a few things that you need to do in, in you know, in terms of the place you, that you live, your home, your work, you know, the supermarket, maybe. You've got a few places. <clears throat> you've got a few lives. Uh, you've got a few people around. You have a few places to go to. And you spend your life just going from one to the other, from one to the other, from one to the other. And at the same time, internally, you're going from this place to that place, to this place, to that place. And, and we forget that what we contain inside of self is not, not the same thing as the reality outside of it. You know, If you've got five people living in the same house, how many houses are there? There are six. There's the house that is in each one's mind because everyone will have a different perspective of the same place. And then the sixth perspective is what it really is without anyone's subjective experience. So these are like, you know, these are like some basic things. If I can see, uh, if I can see the same situation and, and respecting my own perspective, but I can also understand the perspective of others. Wonderful. Because that's, you know, um, you just imagine a situation, for example, there's a road accident. There's a road accident. And someone is killed. He, the, the guy comes from parties. He's had a few drinks. And he gets behind the wheel of the car and he smashes into a tree. Okay. So the scene, the situation, the event is, is, a, is a road action where someone has died. The first one to come along is a policeman. And for him, it's like, you know, another idiot has, has drink, drink, drinking and driving, you know. Another idiot has hit, hit, hit the, you know, added a number to the death list. So he doesn't have any feelings at all. He's just doing his job. Maybe there's a local doctor that's out in the countryside, and so he knows it's a local doctor, they're friends, and he calls him to come. 
can you come over? So the doctor arrives and the doctor sees the dead body. And for him, <laughs> how many dead bodies has a doctor seen? You know, in these anatomy classes and all, it's just a dead body. It's a, it's a carcass, basically. There's no feeling also in the doctor. There's nothing to do. He's already dead. But let's say they realize that this person is, is someone's uh, son and, and uh, this woman is, you know, she's notorious for her hysterics and she's a widow and she's living alone and this is her only son and they're aware of this. So they call the mother to come along. And of course, her reaction is, <laughs> it's the end of the world, right? Her son is her support. It's everything for her and he's gone. And so she becomes hysterical. And the fourth one to come along is a, is a, is a tow truck driver. You know, and he's looking for, for some work. He's looking for some money, and it sees it sees the car there, and this is an opportunity to feed him and his six children, right? And so, the, who has the correct vision? Who has the correct take or the correct view of this situation? Which one is it? The dead person? Maybe he's gone on and he's looking down at the scene from another from, you know, outside of the body, who knows? The policeman, the doctor, the, the mother, the tow truck driver, all of them are looking at this and who has the right view? So we have to understand that, yes, I should respect my own perspective, but I should understand that others will have different perspectives of the same thing. And to do that, I have to sort of become a little bit unlimited so that I'm not just thinking about my role and my story and my this and my that, the two main words in this limited narrative are I and my, right? Now, if I, I sort of open up, and again, when I say open up or remember the flower, I start to feed the seed with the right thoughts and, you know, something beautiful starts to come out. I start, for example to think about my spiritual role. As a human being here on the earth, what am I supposed to be doing? Okay, I, I came here, and I like this phrase of, of uh, a French theologian, Telha de Chardin, we are spiritual beings going through a human experience and not human beings looking for a spiritual one. So I'm this spiritual being going through this human experience. What's my role here? on this earth, you know? What's my eternal story? What's the story before, during, and after this body? What's the story? And if I have attention on my own inner stability and, and my own power of discernment, for example, what would happen? I would start to break down my limitations and I would start to bloom like that flower, right? But the challenge is to use that at unlimited perspective to, um, to help come out of the limited one. So use the unlimited to help the limited. That's our challenge, right? So I'm gonna, let's have us a meditation now in the middle. And then um, we'll, we'll carry on. It's, like, it's good to have a meditation in the middle. And then at the end, we had one in the beginning with the, with the lovely music and now this one. So if everyone, let's just stop what we're doing, have a pause and become still. Let's sit comfortably. With the eyes lightly open, but unfocused. Let's center ourselves. Let's sit on the seat of command and become conscious of this inner being, this seed of, of beauty that's inside me and its qualities. So let's go through this more slowly now. So sitting nicely, best posture I would say is to sit, sit like a king on a throne. very stable, very calm. 
no need to have your eyes uh, very open, but it's good to keep them slightly open so that you're aware of the colors and forms. Now just visit the 360 degrees of things happening around you with your mind. Just become aware of the moment, the sounds that you can hear, the forms and colors that you can see, you can feel the temperature of the air, you can feel your own respiration, you can feel your back on the, on the seat where you're sitting, your feet on the, on the floor maybe. So just become aware of the moment. And also become aware that you're in the center, not only of the 360 degrees of things around you, but in the center of your life. So there are people and objects connected with you, making a sort of a network of people and objects, some closer, some further. Just become aware that, that of that. And just become stable, centered in that situation. And you know that if you, as you become more peaceful and stable, you're actually helping all of the people and things that are connected with you, which is great news. Now, just as you're sitting on the seat, just imagine a subtle seat behind the middle of the forehead where like the headquarters of the consciousness is. That's where you're doing the thinking behind here. Just sit there mentally and appreciate the things around you. Just as you're seated physically and not moving, just imagine yourself seated mentally and, and in the same place, very still, very stable. And in this state, you give yourself the chance to see your and feel your real value. Because I'm not jumping around, so I'm feeling very calm. I'm not wanting anything, so I'm feeling very contented. I'm not, in, I'm not worried about anything, so I feel very sort of peaceful and stable. So I give my chance to experience how I am when I'm in my state of rest. I've rested down to peace and to love and to happiness. These are my real qualities that, you know, I have to give myself a chance to experience them. You know, it's like inheritance from God or something. It's like something very special. So give yourself a chance to feel that. And just enjoy for a few, few more moments, your own qualities, your own value, that you are greater than you thought you were. So that's what we just did. Let's come back now, open your eyes a bit more and we'll go on. Just a few more slides. Um, basic question here, you know, things, as I said, happen from outside of us and things should happen from inside of us. So from outside, challenges come, which produce demands, you know, a challenge is saying you need to do this, you need to be that, you need to go here, you need to prepare for this. So challenges come and they produce demands. And I have to produce these responses somehow and I have to bring them out from my inner state. So this is basically the, the um, juxtaposition of life, to use a word. This is how we arrange ourselves. 
all of the things happening around us, all of the things happening within us, and we have to sort of dance with, with those things. So if the demand is great and the response is little, I'm probably difficult. And if I don't know how to produce the right response, let's say the situation is demanding that I become, that I be more tolerant, but I'm just not able to produce that tolerance because I don't know how to bring that outside, that from inside me, right? So if I ask you now, think of the situation around you at this moment and any main concern that you have. Got it? You're thinking about it? So what is that situation requiring you to be? What is the situation demanding from you in terms of a response? Do you have to be more tolerant? Do you have to be more patient? Do you have to be more loving? Do you have to be more uh, silent? Do you have to be more determined, strong, courageous? What do you have to be? And how are you going to do that? And the only way to bring something from inside out is through something like meditation, because in meditation, you go down deep into yourself and you realize that you do have the raw material for that particular quality and you can produce it, you can bring it out. Now, if you don't know how to go inside yourself, you won't get there. So this is it's basic, you know, basic understanding of things. And it's, it's true that many situations have many factors. Um, there are deep, deep factors that we generally don't consider because we're too superficial. And there are these superficial factors and there's a the situation itself. So let's say there's me and another person, we have a problem, right? Me and the other person. Just a, a, a very simple example. The person criticized me publicly, made me feel bad, made me feel little, belittled me in public. Of course, how dare he do that? That's a pretty typical reaction. And so the situation from my side was that I got, I lost my temper and shouted at him really badly. You know, a pretty typical situation between two people, right? Now at a superficial level, I know that, you know, he's very partial about certain things. He's not open, you know. He's badly informed. I know that he didn't have all of the information. That's why he criticized me. Uh, he's, I know that he's going through some a divorce, so he's very frustrated with this. And he's aggressive, right? So I, uh, that's my reading, a, a superficial reading of him. Uh, now, let me do a reading of myself to be, be, to be fair, right? Why did I shout? Why he criticized me in public, that's his problem. But why did I shout? I, I know I'm feeling, I've been feeling a bit lost lately. I've been very, very tired and therefore a little bit irritable. I'm feeling agitated and also hey. So th these are like just a, a quick reading of superficial things that I can... If I really sit down and try to understand what happened objectively, I come up with my little list. But I need to go deeper than that. But why was that other person aggressive, frustrated, badly informed and partial? Why? I know that he's, you know, chronically he's been a pessimist as long as I've known him. Um, he has, I think he has low self-esteem. Uh, he's lonely. He's lonely, lonely guy. He's unhappy. So as I start to see deeper reasons, I start to feel more uh, sympathetic with him, more compassion. You know, he's got some, you know, like as if he's got a nail stuck in his hand. And that's creating all of this state of mind where he's, you know, does something really bad publicly. I have to help him. He, he's suffering. 
if I see the suffering and not and not the the situation as such, but if I see that suffering, I'm I will tend to be more compassionate. In the same way, if I go into myself, what about me at a deeper level? I feel that I'm trapped in many situations. Some emotional emptiness is there. I am going through some existential pain, <laughs> let's say. There's a lack of peace that I could say. So all of those factors together have produced this situation where he, he criticized me badly publicly and I, uh, I lost my temper and shouted. It was a pretty simple life situation, right? Now there's even a deeper level. If I go down really deep and I go behind all of these factors, I go behind all of these factors. At a deeper level, we are pretty similar. He wants to be happy, I want to be happy. He wants to be peaceful, I want to be peaceful. He um, thinks that he is better than what he really is. And also, I think that I'm better than what I, what I think I am. So these two, you know, I have to see beyond the coverings. I have to see that behind that face, behind that personality, behind that behavior, behind all of these different facets, there's a shining seed of potential a, a potential flower like this one, maybe a different color, you know, like this white one here. Different but similar. So if I allow that to happen, I, I can pretty much get along with everyone. Because people are not what they do. <laughs> people are not their behavior. People are not definitely not their reputation. So I have to see behind all of these coverings, let's say, and then maybe I can get along with people. You know, you can use this idea for yourself. If you get a, if you get a, if you're in a conflict situation, sit down and do this. Describe the situation for yourself and for the other. You know, describe the situation for yourself and the other. What he did, what you did, what could be a superficial factor on his side and your side, and then what could be a deeper factor on his side and on your side. And then probably you'll not only think that I am greater than what I thought I was, but you would also think, yes, that other person also greater than either he thinks he is and certainly greater than what I was thinking he was. So these are like, you know, some tricks that we can do to increase our understanding of ourselves and of other people, especially in conflict situations. So how special are you? How special are you? I've got some questions just for you to consider. You can write these down and, and you can do them for homework. What do you like to do that benefits others? So when we ask how special are you, it means how great are you really? How much better are you really than you think you are? What do you like to do that benefits others? This is homework, okay? And then we'll finish with some meditation as well. Second question. What do you do well that benefits others? Some talent you have, some ability you have, some skill. What do you do well that benefits others? It doesn't mean it's something you may like to do it doesn't mean that you, you're good at it either, but that you like to do that. You like to do that. Like I asked this guy in Italy, what do you like to do? He says, I like to make macar uh, macaroni. But why do you do that? He said, I like to serve the people with the macaroni. 
So first, what do you like to do that benefits others? And what do you do well that benefits others? Those two questions are really, really good starters to try to bring out your sense of greatness, to make the flower bloom. Third question is more is deeper, this one. What does the world need from you? What does the world need from you? Since you are special, what does the world need from you being special? Think, look at your own personal world first and then maybe at the bigger world. But what does your world need from you at this moment? And, of course, if you start to serve through that speciality, you'll definitely increase your self-respect. Absolutely guaranteed. And the fourth question is, is, is probably laying it really down in, 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 in worldly terms. What are you paid to do? So if what you like to do benefits others, and what you do well benefits others. If you've got those two things happening and you're also understanding what the world needs for, from you and also <laughs> you're, uh, you're earning your living from doing that, happy. That's the re recipe for happiness. It's like this, you know. How to prioritize our lives. What do you like to do? What the world needs from you, what you're paid to do, <laughs> what you do well. Yeah, and then where these things these things intersect, the intersection between what you like to do and what you do well is your passion. The intersection between what the world needs from all you and what you like to do is your vacation. What you are paid to do, and what the world needs from you is, is your service in a way. It's charity, like some people work in the public uh, in the in the non government sector. And they're able to create their lives on the basis of that. And what you're paid to do and what you do well is your career. But of course, these are the things that happen. You get fulfillment here, you get contentment there, you get comfort there, and you know, uh, and you get satisfaction here. So all of those things together. Bliss, bliss. So it's possible on the basis of those questions, we go back to those questions and this dial, we can send you these, these uh, PowerPoints later on if you want. But these questions can help us to make us feel that we have something to give to the world and to be an instrument of good is probably the quickest way to develop your self-respect. So let's have some meditation just to finish off again. Sorry. We can send you this material if you like. So again, and I guess and then there'll be some time for some questions, I think. Just sit comfortably. Become centered. All of the things happening around you, physically and also in your life, you're in the center of it all and still and stable. Sit on your subtle seat behind the middle of the forehead. Very still, very stable, very calm. And enjoy your inner qualities, peace, love, happiness, purity also, power. You have these qualities, so nurture this seed. Meditate on it. Understand that this is your internal legacy received from, from the divine one. And take care of it.
Okay, let's open our eyes a bit more. If there are any questions, and please feel free, we can answer a few questions if necessary. Ken, that was a beautiful sharing. So I'm sure on behalf of everyone who has learned so much more about themselves, thank you and bless you. Currently, we have no questions that I can see. But I, lo I was, always love to ask one question of those who have a wisdom of experience. Is there one message of hope you could give to humanity now? What would it be? A message of hope for humanity now. What, what would you choose? What would you love to give? Well, I think that if we look at the situations, yes, they're very, very drastic. Everything's going mm. towards a cliff, it looks like. But at a personal level, nothing will happen that is greater than your capacity to deal with it. Nothing can happen that is greater than your capacity to deal with it. But you have to invest in that capacity. It's happening exactly to us because uh, we have the ability to deal with it. So understand that there are lessons behind everything. Just don't do a superficial reading of the situation. You'll get lost in it. There's some hidden benefit behind every situation. And that, Ken, is where the power of self-respect, your number one, is so vital. Yeah, self-respect, I guess, is number one, uh, let's say, tool or weapon that we need for getting through any situation you know like today i was talking to someone who who got covid right and she's quite ill actually uh, she went to the hospital yesterday but there she's under observation and you know like we've had a few uh, people in the, in our community here in the in the in our meditation center here who have been infected and have died from, from the illness. So on one level, you can be thinking about all that. Look what happened when someone gets sick. Look at all of the, you know, we've had other people that have survived and, you know, they're, they're really tired or they don't, you know, they, they, their respiration hasn't got right even now. So you look at all of the symptoms and all of the stories and all of the information on, on YouTube and on, on Facebook and so on, you, you, can, you can be completely uh, overwhelmed by just the word that you've got COVID, right? Or you've got cancer, for example. You start to remember all of the things and the nasty things that people have. You could also remember what you have inside you. You have power, you have understanding, you have a sense of truth. Work on those things. And with that, uh, you know, developed out, then you can face, uh, you know, the, the situation. Don't face the situation with fake news, mm. you know, false responses. Yes, gossip is very painful. It's an yeah. illusion. Ken, there are yeah. two questions here I'd like to invite you to consider. The one is, um, how do you get rid of negativity and how to discover your speciality? Okay. Yeah, good questions. The first one, of course, I think is, is um, it's like asking how to get rid of the dark. You get rid of the dark by turning on the light. You can't fight against darkness. You know why? Because it doesn't have a source. Darkness has no source. It's just mm -hmm. the absence of light. In the same way, cold has no source. It's just the absent, absence of heat. An absolute zero, I think it's 273 below zero, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's just the total absence of heat. 
So the answer to coldness is to heat up. <laughs> the answer to, to or rug up, you know, put some more clothes on maybe. The answer to, to um, darkness is to turn on the light. So the more that we meditate on the light within, the more that we develop it out. It's like cultivating the light within. And as my own light becomes bright, I start to see things. If you've ever seen those miners with, uh, with lights on their caps, mm. right, their helmets, you've seen a miner with a, with a light in the front of his helmet, so in the same way, I start to see things more clearly and I don't trip over. So when I'm living in the dark, I trip over every, when I'm living in darkness, I trip over everything. But when I put on a little bit of light, I can see the things as they are. The same things, the same people, I see them more clearly as I develop my own inner light. I'll the other one is, Sorry, Kevin, please. please. The other one about the speciality, I think, is mm -hmm. connected with what I ask now. What do you like to do that is useful for the world? And what can you do? What, or what you're already doing, which is useful, useful for the world? What do you think you have that the world needs? Answer those questions. What do you think you have? What do you think that you have to offer? What do you think the world needs? Even if it's your own personal world. And what are the things that naturally interest you? These are these all together will say, yes, this is your speciality. Mm -hmm. you know? It's not the fact that you can type quickly. Mm -hmm. That's not, a, not the speciality that I'm talking about. But what do you do with what you type quickly? <laughs> How what do you do with whatever you write? Mm -hmm. That's your speciality. It's not and the the skill, but it's what you do with it. And everybody carries a, a presence and a warmth. And if that can be expressed, that is an, also another form of speciality. Just be a good person to know and to do your best. That's it. So everyone can ask that question. Uh, are people happier when I arrive or when I leave? <laughs> Happy to see you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But Ken, there's a, a question which is quite common when we have our special guests. How would you discriminate between conflicting situations? Is there a special power or technique which is maybe um, rooted in inner, insecurity, inner insecurities? No, I think, I, I think I, we did talk about that. There was a conflict, right, I described? Yes where someone criticized me in public and, and I lost my, my head with the person. It's, you, can, you can scale that up between a problem between countries, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, or a problem between different, different groups of people or even between religions, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it's like I... If I'm part of that, I have to understand, first of all, there's a conflict because we have something in common. You've got mum and dad fighting in the corner and, and the little boy is sitting in the corner crying, right? Mother and father fighting with each other and they're not even aware of the little Johnny sitting in the corny, corner mm -hmm. crying. So the way that they can come back together is to realise what they have in common, which is little Johnny. In his future. But if they can't do that, there's probably no, nothing to do. Well, what do we have in common? And that's the basis of the word communication, right? In Latin, commun means common. So communication, communicare in Latin, is to share what we have in common. If I don't know what I have in common with someone, I'm not communicating. So that's the, that's the essence. The first step into solving conflicts is to start to communicate around common themes and common issues. And then, you know, there's the superficial level and then the deeper level, and maybe there's a spiritual factors also that we can bring into it. And then we can see the whole picture. And then we can come to 
Uh, the problem is this one. The problem is this one. So let me, you know, this is a, these are the sorts of things that we could do, okay? Oh, Thank you, Ken. I'm just picking up on some questions. How do you keep a clean intellect? When there's so much going on around you, how can we keep a clean, a clean mind? I think it's, uh, let me say, if I see beyond the defects, if I just keep the defects and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the defects and the defects, both of those things, if I keep them in mind only, then I won't have a clean mind. And if I don't have a That's clean true. mind, I can't decide very well. So I have to sort of step back, become a detached observer, see the whole picture. And as I see more, I can understand more. And as I understand more, I can decide better. So, and basically see the best in everyone. Well, not just see the best in everything and everyone. There is something behind the scene that I have to see. I have to understand why, uh, what are the things that motivate me and what are the things that are motivating the other person. Just, uh, if I want to keep a clean mind about something, I have to see their virtues naturally. They may have 10 defects, but let me see whatever the virtue is, because even the def defects sometimes indicate some virtue that's being repressed, right? Someone's very determined, but at the same time intolerant, right? Yeah. They're so determined, they're not aware of other people's feelings, and they steamroll ahead and smash over everyone. Determination is great, but not like that, right? So let me just see the determination and give them good wishes that their determination becomes such that it doesn't steamroll over everyone. Okay. Ken, I think we've run out of questions. That's okay. Bless you and thank you. You gave us all a gift of a flower. I'd like yeah. to give you the gift of a diamond. Wow, if it was a real because diamond. Because you have given something for each and every one of us. You've opened your heart, you've opened your soul, and you really touched the heart and soul of us all. So on behalf of everyone and the team, to you, Ken, in Brazil, your ancient wisdom has really, really inspired us all with clarity and simplicity. Okay, Peter, thanks so much. If it were a real diamond, I'd come over there and get it. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to come to Brazil to give it to you. <laughs> I'm just going to stretch and get a special message for everyone. So thank you all from around the world who've uh, joined us this evening. And I hope the uh, translators, we didn't speak too quickly for you. So blessings and thanks to all the translators. A message from Harmony House Meditation Center uh, in Kuwait here. Um, there is an Arabic meditation tomorrow evening at 6.30. Uh, that's Kuwait time. I think the same time for Bahrain. And in addition to that, um, Harmony House or, uh, is a Bahrain center, is introducing a meditation course in Arabic. And that will start on Monday, the 6th of September. And to register for this, if you please go to the WhatsApp or to the email, and the team will be delighted to hear from you and support you in any way we can. So once again, Ken, bless you. Thank you so, so much, and everyone for joining us this evening. Bye-bye. Thanks bye -bye. so much. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you.